Are you going to do this with me with the man? Yeah, I got it. Not for you. Thank you. May we approach? Yes, you may. Thank you. Okay, any preliminary matters that we need to address on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor. Any preliminary matters on behalf, on behalf of the defense? No. Okay, um, are both sides ready to go into the opening statements? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I, I do intend to call um, them in. I'll do a short, some short, short instructions, and then we'll proceed with opening. I'll see how long the state's is. We talked about approximately an hour each. See how long the state's is, and then we'll decide whether to take a break at that time. It might be appropriate to take a break in between the openings, especially the first break after lunch. Okay, um, when the jury's ready, we can bring them in.
Please be seated. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Has anyone read or been exposed to reading newspaper headlines and or articles relating to this trial or its participants? Has anyone seen or heard television, radio, or internet comments about this trial? Has anyone conducted or been exposed to any research regarding any matters concerning this case? And have you discussed this case among yourselves or with anyone else or allowed anyone to discuss it in your presence? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected and sworn as the jury to try the case of the State of Florida versus Brandon Lee Bradley. This is a criminal trial. Mr. Brandon Lee Bradley is charged with count one, first degree premeditated murder of a law enforcement officer with firearm, count two, robbery, count three, fleeing or attempting to elude high speed or wanton disregard. Count four, resisting an officer with violence. The definition of the elements of the crimes charged will be explained to you later. It is your solemn responsibility to determine if the state has proved its accusations beyond a reasonable doubt against Brandon Lee Bradley. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or lack of evidence and the law. The charging document is not evidence and is not to be considered by you as any proof of guilt. It is the judge's responsibility to decide which laws apply to this case and to explain those laws to you. It is your responsibility to decide what the facts of this case may be and to apply the laws to those facts. Thus, the province of the jury and the province of the court are well defined and they do not overlap. This is one of the fundamental principles of our system of justice. Before proceeding further, it will be helpful if you understand how a trial is conducted. At the beginning of the trial, the attorneys will have an opportunity, if they wish, to make an opening statement. The opening statement gives the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. What the attorneys say is not evidence, and you are not to consider it as such. Following the opening statements, witnesses will be called to testify under oath. They will be examined and cross-examined by the attorneys. Documents and other exhibits also may be produced as evidence. After the evidence has been presented, the attorneys will have an opportunity to make their final argument. Following the arguments by the attorneys, the court will instruct you on the law applicable to the case. After the instructions are given, you will then retire to consider your verdict. You should not form any definite or fixed opinion on the merits of the case until you have heard all the evidence, the arguments of the lawyers, and the instruction on the law by the judge. Until that time, you should not discuss this case among yourselves, even while in the jury deliberation room. You cannot discuss this case with anyone until I instruct you to do so. During the course of the trial, the court may take recesses during which you will be permitted to separate and go about your personal affairs. During these recesses, you should not discuss this case with anyone, nor permit anyone to say anything to you or in your presence about this case. If anyone attempts to say anything to you or in your presence about this case, tell him or her that you are on the jury trying the case and ask that person to stop. If he or she persists, Leave the person at once and immediately report the matter to the deputy, who will advise me. The case must be tried by you only on the evidence presented during the trial in your presence and in the presence of the defendant, the attorneys, and the judge. Jurors must not conduct any investigation of their own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any places discussed during the trial. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends or family members about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let even 
the closest family member make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. In this age of electronic communication, I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using any electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet, website, chat room, or blog. Also, if any of you have a personal problem or some other matter which you feel needs to be brought to the court's attention or to the attention of anyone involved in this trial, the proper person for you to speak to about that would be one of the court deputies. Do not try to speak to me, one of the attorneys, or the defendant directly. The attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence and trial procedure, and it is their duty to make all objections that they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on why it is made. Likewise, when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you must not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained, nor what a witness might have said had he or she been permitted to answer. If you would like to take notes during the trial, you may do so. On the other hand, you are not required to take notes if you do not want to. This will be left up to you individually. You have been provided with a notebook and a pencil for use if you wish to take notes. Any notes that you take will be for your personal use. However, you should not take them with you from the courtroom. During recesses, the court deputy will take possession of your notes and return them to you when we reconvene. After you have completed, you will be allowed to take them into the jury deliberation room with you. And after you have completed your deliberations, the, the court deputy will deliver your notes to me. They will be destroyed. No one will ever read your notes. If you take notes, do not get so involved in note taking that you become distracted by, by, from the proceeding. Your notes should be used only as aids to your memory. Whether or not you take notes, you should rely on your memory of the evidence and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. During the trial, I too am taking notes. If I begin to write notes, that is not a signal to you that what is being said is important or more important than the other evidence you are hearing. Because our tasks are quite different, what I am listening for is different from what you are listening for. Do not conclude from anything I do during the trial that some parts of the trial are more important and some are not. You should listen to all the evidence, then after you have heard it all, you should decide as best you can what evidence was important and what was not. At this time, the attorneys for the parties will have an opportunity to make opening statements in which they may explain to you the issues in the case and summarize the facts that they expect the evidence will show. After all the evidence has been received, the attorneys again will have an opportunity to address you to make their final arguments. The statements that the attorneys now make and the arguments that they later make are not to be considered by you either as evidence in this case or as your instruction on the law. Nevertheless, these statements and arguments are intended to help you properly understand the issues, the evidence, and the applicable law, and so you should give them your close attention. Okay, opening statement on behalf of the state. Yes, you may. Judge. Hold on.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a personal press personal problem that you think needs to be brought to my attention or to the attention of anyone involved in this case, if you the proper way to do that would be, to, if you can, tear off a piece of paper, give a note to one of the court deputies. If it's an emergency, get their attention first if you can't get my attention. Um, it will be given to the court deputies, but all, all matters will be given to the court and will be addressed by me. It's not that the, the uh, matters will not be addressed by the court deputies. The court deputies will be the person that will exchange that information, and the information will be given to the court and will be addressed by the court. Okay, opening statement on behalf of the, of the on behalf of the state. Okay, please support counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. The evidence in this case will show that on March 6th of 2012, the defendant, Brandon Bradley, shot and killed the Bar County Sheriff's Office deputy, Barbara Bill. The evidence won't show that he did it because he had a grudge against Deputy Bill or even that he knew her or her family. The evidence will show that he killed Deputy Bill because he had a plan to kill any police officer who tried to send him back to prison. On March 6, 2012, Deputy Barbara Bill was a law enforcement officer in the performance of her duties. She had stopped the defendant as part of her investigation and assisting another officer in the robbery that had occurred at York Inn, the Econo Lodge up on 192. As the, you will hear from the witnesses in the case and the defendant's own words, she had seen his face, she had seen his tag number, she was about to find out he was a wanted criminal, she was about to send him back to prison, and for that she had to die. Deputy Barbara Pill was killed because on the morning of March 6th of 2012, the defendant, Brandon Bradley, knew more than she did. They say that in the fog of battle, information is the key to survival. And on the morning of March 6th, Deputy Barbara Pill didn't have the information that she needed to survive that day's war on crime. That morning, Deputy Pill got up and prepared for work just as she had for approximately 10 years with the Mark County Sheriff's Office. She put on a uniform and gun belt. She got into her Mark Patrol car. She went out on the streets of Brevard County to patrol and protect and serve. She didn't know that there was a life and death battle coming up with a man named Frank Bradley. She didn't know that it was a battle that had been set in motion almost a year earlier. Deputy didn't Pill didn't know that in February of 2011, over one year before Deputy Pill was shot, Brandon Bradley had skipped out on his probation. She didn't know that uh, probation officer Charles Cologne, who was supervising Mr. Uh, Bre uh, Bradley, was going to object. Bench conference.
Deputy Hill didn't know that to Probation Officer Charles Cologne had requested and that the court had issued three separate arrest warrants for his arrest with a no bond status on each of the warrants. She didn't know and had no way of knowing that on November 26th of 2011, a man named Robert Marks stole a semi-automatic pistol, a Glock Model 27, 40 caliber, uh, caliber handgun. She didn't know that he sold it to the defendant, Brandon Bradley. She didn't know that Brandon Bradley kept the gun with him wherever he went. But Brandon Bradley knew all of these things, and he knew he wasn't going back to prison. The evidence in this case will show that on the morning hours of March 6th of 2012, while Deputy Hill was patrolling the streets of Brevard County in her patrol car, Brandon Bradley was at the York Hotel with his girlfriend, Andrea Kirchner. They had been staying at the hotel for several days, had been in a different room earlier, and then had moved to room 268 in the hotel near the back, off of 192, close to 95. The, uh, Mr. Bradley and Ms. Kirchner were checking out of the hotel on March 6th. They had already paid the, the day's fare and were ready to leave in the mid-morning hours of March 6th. They began to load Mr. Bradley's vehicle, a white uh, Ford SUV, with uh, their belongings. They then began to load the SUV with the hotel room property took the sheets, and pillows, and bedspreads off the beds, put them in the vehicle. They took the pictures off of the walls of the motel room and carried them down to the vehicle. They tried to take the TV and AC unit out of the wall, but they were secured and couldn't get them. They could only get the cable to the TV and the cover to the air conditioning. They took the end table and even the metal soap holder from the shower and the bathroom. They even took the room's ice bucket and trash can took it all down to the SUV. Some of the uh, items were put directly into the SUV, which was backed up next to the hotel room, right next to a stairwell. And some of the items were left on the ground out near the back of the SUV, SUV so that they could load them into it. As they went back and forth in the room to the vehicle carrying this property, ultimately they attracted the attention of some of the hotel employees. The employees confronted the couple about what they were doing. Initially, they tried to deny that they were taking the property, but ultimately, additional employees came over, and there were approximately five employees uh, that gathered around the SUV and Mr. Bradley and Ms. Kirch. They were demanding the property back, or they were going to call the police. You'll hear from the employees, including Andrew Jordan, Tammy Brown, Vanessa McNerney, and the hotel owner, Muhammad Mahler possibly other witnesses, including a guest who observed Mr. Bradley and Ms. Kirchner carrying the property from the room down to the field. When the property was ordered to be returned by the motel employees, initially they refused and they just got into the vehicle. Mr. Bradley behind the wheel of the SUV and Ms. Kirchner in the front passenger seat. Ultimately, Ms. Kirchner handed out one of the pillows through one of the windows of the SUV passenger side to one of the employees. But at that time, they started to take off. Mr. Malik, the owner of the hotel, got on the phone and called 911, requested help because people were stealing property from his hotel, and gave the 911 operator a description of the vehicle and even a license tag. In an effort to keep the two from leaving the hotel with all of the hotel property, employee Andrew Jordan, sort of a handyman around the hotel, been employed there for a number of years, stood in front of the vehicle so that the vehicle couldn't leave without running him over. Brandon Bradley, seeing Mr. Jordan in front of him and the other employees around him, nonetheless started the vehicle up and started forward with the SUV. Mr. Jordan continued to maintain the spot in front of the vehicle as long as he could until afraid that he was going to get run over because the vehicle continued to come at him. He tried to jump out of the way. As he did, uh, Mr. Bradley continued out with the SUV, striking Mr. Jordan on the hip with the front corner of the vehicle. As Mr. Malik remained on the telephone with the 911 operator, Mr. Bradley drove the vehicle with he and Ms. Kirchner in it 
uh, northbound toward I-92 and then eastbound on 192 where uh, they were lost sight. Deputy Troop, James Troop of the Brevard County Sheriff's Office was assigned the call, which went out initially as a theft of property from the hotel. He started heading toward the hotel. Deputy Barbara Pill, who was also assigned to that area, was on another call at the time. She cleared that call shortly after this call went out and started to head toward the, the motel to assist uh, Deputy Troop in looking for the vehicle, which at that time had left the hotel. As Deputy Pill headed northbound on John Rhodes Boulevard looking for the vehicle and heading toward the motel near the uh, location of the Lamplighter Village Trailer Park on John Rhodes Boulevard <coughs> just south of O'Gallon. She was heading southbound. She observed a white SUV heading northbound. She turned her vehicle around from the uniform patrol car and began to try to catch up with the SUV heading, heading northbound caught up to the SUV at approximately the area of O'Galley and the intersection of John Rhodes, where the SUV continued northbound. Uh, Deputy Bill pulled in behind the SUV and at that point was able to confirm that the vehicle was the one that had been reported as leaving the hotel because the tag number was the same. Deputy Bill, vehicle was equipped with an in-car video system which turns on automatically or is automatically activated when the overhead lights are turned on to uh, perform a traffic stop. When she turned on the lights just north of O'Galley Boulevard to try to pull the SUV over, her in-car video camera was activated and began to record the scene in front of the vehicle. Deputy Bill reported to dispatch that she was able to see a black male driver and that the SUV was stopping in a residential neighborhood on Elena Way, just west of John Rhodes Boulevard. It's a short residential, one block long uh, residential area heading westbound off of John Rhodes just before you get to the curve where it turns into Aurora Road. During the time that the vehicle came to a stop, between the time that Deputy Phil turned her lights on and the time that the vehicle came to a stop, there was activity going on inside the vehicle that obviously is not captured by Deputy Phil's in-car video. You will hear testimony from witnesses about what happened inside the vehicle during that several minute period between when the lights were turned on and the confrontation between Deputy Phil and Brandon Bradley took place. You'll hear from the co-defendant in this case, Andrea Kirchner. Ms. Kirchner was present in the front seat. She will tell you about the events at the hotel. She will tell you about the traffic stop. And she will tell you that as Deputy Phil was attempting to stop the vehicle, that Brandon Bradley told her, she's seen me. I'm not going to prison. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to prevent her from sending me to prison. If I have to shoot the tracker, I'll do it. You will hear that she argued with Brandon Bradley trying to talk him out of shooting Deputy Phil. You will hear that not only did she say this, trying to talk him out of shooting Deputy Phil, but she pleaded with him, no big, you don't have to do this, no big, don't do this. For several minutes they went back and forth with her attempting to convince Mr. Bradley not to shoot the deputy. As she was doing this, unbeknownst to her, she had been previously having a telephone conversation with a fellow named Jeffrey Diegos. Mr. Diegos will testify for you that uh, he was having several conversations with Ms. Kirchner that morning and that one of the conversations ended up with an open line. Telephone records for that will show that it, it, uh, the phone call that uh, Mr. Diegos is going to testify about uh, was placed at approximately 10.48 in the morning and lasted 32 minutes. Mr. Diegas will tell you that during this 32-minute period, he was listening to the conversation Ms. Kirchner was having in the vehicle, that he actually heard the siren of Deputy Phil going to whoop whoop, where she activated, which you will see on the NPR video, to make the traffic stop. He will testify that he heard the conversation between the male inside the vehicle and Ms. Kirchner, and that the male was saying, she saw my face. 
you saw my tag. I got to kill that bitch. And then Ms. Kirchner's reply was, no, baby, you don't have to do that. No, baby, don't do that. And that they went back and forth, Mr. Bradley insisting that he was going to kill the deputy. And Ms. Kirchner trying to talk him out. The in-car video will show what happened next. Deputy Bill exited a patrol car and called out to the driver of the SUV to exit his vehicle. The driver opened his door but did not exit. Deputy Pill continued to order the driver to exit his vehicle to no avail. At this time, she advised dispatch that the driver was refusing to exit the vehicle and she requested backup. She also reported that there was also a white female in the vehicle in addition to the driver. What is not shown on the video, but what the testimony will show is at this time, uh, Deputy James Troop, who was at the hotel, heard the request for the backup and that he was having difficulty getting the driver out of the vehicle. And he started in his vehicle from the motel to the area, which is about three or four miles away. This is only about 10, 10 minutes or so after the 911 call had been placed. Uh, he headed toward the, uh, the scene with the uh, lights and siren, as well as other deputies who heard the call. The in-car video continues to show what was happening on the lane away as the deputies were responding. It's back up. At that time, the, the white SUV began to move forward as if attempting to leave the area, but with the driver's door still open, it actually pulled forward about five or ten feet. With Deputy Bill kind of chasing after him, yelling for it to stop. Deputy Bill approached the vehicle, ordering the driver to stop. The vehicle did stop. He didn't keep going. He actually stopped the vehicle. And at that time, Deputy Bill approached the open door, which was cracked open about a foot or so and began to reach into the vehicle. We'll never know exactly what she was reaching for because at that moment, the defendant raised a gun and fired eight shots in rapid succession, striking and mortally wounding Deputy Hill. Deputy Hill never even had a chance to go for her weapon. Her last act was to reach for the emergency transmission button on her breastplate armor and activate that and attempt to call for help which only allowed the sounds of gunshots to be broadcast over the radio. The shooting of Deputy Phil was witnessed by an ex-door neighbor on the lane away where the, action, where the action took place. She had just arrived home as Deputy Phil was doing the traffic stop, kitty corner out in front of her house. Uh, she had seen a black male driver in the driver's seat of the SUV. She pulled into her driveway to unload her child from the vehicle. She'd been shopping that day. And as she was attempting to unload the child, she heard the shots and looked up. She saw Deputy Pill fall to the ground. And the white SUV drive away slowly in a semicircle and exit back out for John Road Boulevard and head north on John Rhodes. Ms. Logan ran to Deputy Pill and called 911. At the same time, as the shots went off, there were several Melbourne police officers less than 100 yards away in a nearby uh, neighborhood conducting their own investigations on different things. And they reported over their radios hearing several gunshots in the area and requested backup from a number of police officers. Deputy James Troop, who was still on his way to the scene in Atlanta, heard the gunshots over his in-car radio and actually shows up on his in-car video, which is taping also from the time he turned his lights on. He arrived at the scene less than one minute after the shots were fired. He found Deputy Phil's vehicle there with an open door. He found Deputy Phil lying on the pavement, bleeding profusely from the head and other areas of the body. He radioed in that there was an officer down and he needed fire rescue. The second deputy, Victor Velez, arrived just a few seconds later. They were advised by Ms. Lohman of the description of the vehicle, the white SUV, which they already knew that they were looking for, and the direction of its travel, which was northbound on John Rose Boulevard. And they reported it to other responding law enforcement officers who were at that time flooding into the area in response to the uh, backup calls and the shots fired calls. A few minutes later, one of the responding Melbourne police officers and Coincidentally, one of the ones who had initially heard the shots being fired at, from the trailer park next door to him uh, by the name of Derek Middendorf, 
was driving north on uh, Turtle Mound. Right? As he was driving north on Turtle Mound from Aurora, he was looking down the side streets to see if he could see the white SUV. He passed a road named Carroll, which parallels Aurora Road just to the north, runs into uh, uh, Turtle Mound. As he looked down the roadway, he could see a white SUV about a quarter of a mile down in front of some houses. But he was driving fairly fast, and he passed the intersection. By the time he stopped and backed up and was able to turn into Carrollwood, the vehicle had disappeared. But he radioed to the other officers that that's where he had last seen it. Other Melbourne police officers, other responding sheriff's office deputies began to flood the area surrounding the point the SUV was last seen on Carrollwood. One of the uh, Melbourne officers, or several of the Melbourne officers, led by Sergeant Mike Casey, got out of their vehicles in the area where the SUV was last seen. They could see that there appeared to be some tire tracks going off into the grass behind one of the houses, and it looked like it might have gone into a wooded area by a little pond that was behind one of these residences. Sergeant Casey and several of the other Melbourne police officers got out of the vehicles and started searching the wooded area by, uh, by foot. As they were doing that, a resident on the next street north from Carrollwood, which was Janewood, came out of his residence and had seen the police officers with the helicopters and wondered what was going on. As he started to exit his residence, he saw in his open garage a white female, one who was later identified as Andrea Kircher, standing in the garage. He also noticed that there was a white SUV parked in his driveway that he had nothing to do with. He looked and he saw the police officers in the back. He asked Ms. Kirchner what she was doing there. She said, I'm, I'm looking for gas. He knew something wasn't right. And he ran to the police officers to tell them what he had seen. He ran into Sergeant Casey. Sergeant, he told Sergeant Casey just what he had just seen. There was a white female in his garage, the white SUV in the driveway. And Sergeant Casey alerted the other officers, and they began to run toward Mr. Weber's house on Jamie. As they rounded the corner of Mr. Weber's house, they observed the white SUV now leaving the driveway of Mr. Weber's residence and heading eastbound on Jamie. At that point, the Brevard County Sheriff's Office helicopter was already in the air and searching the area for the SUV. And at about the same time as the SUV was leaving the driveway, it was spotted by the helicopter, and it was also spotted by Sergeant uh, Trevor Schaefer from the Melbourne Police Department, who was located farther west on Jane Wood, looking through the, uh, the neighborhood of the vehicle and the chase. The vehicle drove eastbound on Jane Wood to a, a road named Carey Wood, which curves back down around toward Carroll Wood. At this point, the officers had radioed in to the other officers that they were in chase of the vehicle suit of it and what direction it was going, and other officers who had been setting up the perimeter began to deploy so that they could deploy stop sticks if necessary to dis disable the vehicle and make it stop. Uh, Sergeant Schaefer got directly in behind the white SUV and began to chase it with its siren, with this siren lights. It had a parked vehicle, it didn't have the lights on top, but it was a fully marked Melbourne machine. And he had his lights on and siren on trying to get the SUV to stop, but it wouldn't stop. It drove south on Cary Wood and turned eastbound on Carrollwood again. And it drove a short distance from Carrollwood out to uh, uh, Turtle Mound Road, turning left on Turtle Mound and now heading northbound on Turtle Mound, being chased by the helicopter which was filming the entire incident by Sergeant Trevor Schaefer, who was directly behind the SUV trying to get it to stop and going past other officers who at that point had deployed themselves at the corner of Carrollwood and Jane Wood, or Carrie Wood, at the corner of uh, Turtle Mound and Carrollwood and further down on Turtle Mound at the little intersection called Palomino. At the Palomino intersection was an officer from the Melbourne Police Department named Chad Cooper. He heard over the radio that the vehicle was coming his way, and he looks out, found it, could see it coming, followed by Sergeant Trevor Schaefer. He got his stop sticks out, and as the SUV came by him at a high rate of speed, he deployed the stop sticks, 
resulting in the inflating of at least one, possibly two of the tires at that particular location. And he then began to chase the vehicles also. He got in as the number two car behind Sergeant Tre Trevor Schaefer and participated in the chase northbound on Turtle Mountain Road, filming the his in car video the entire sequence of events from the time he had first headed to the area to set up his perimeter. You will see the video show the erratic driving by Mr. Bradley, driving at a high rate of speed, going on different sides of the road, trying to avoid additional stop sticks deployed by the Melbourne police officers, going through stop signs at the intersection of Lake Washington and, and uh, Turtle Mound Road, and continuing to head northbound. You will see the chase. You will just follow the chase both from the helicopter and from uh, Officer Cooper's vehicle as it goes north on Turtle Mound Road until it reaches the intersection of Parkway, the Parkway dead ends into Turtle Mound. At that point, the vehicle attempted to make a turn going eastbound on Parkway, and it was because apparently because of the inflated tires, I believe there are three of them inflated at this point. It was unable to make the turn. It ran into a stop sign, not being a stop sign yet. At first, the police cars came to a stop behind it, thinking that the vehicle was stopped, but the vehicle continued on started up again, and started to head down eastbound on Parkway, but lost control again, and rolled over on its passenger side into a ditch filled with about six to eight inches of water in front of a residence about 100, 100 yards east of Turtle Mound Road on Parkway. At that point, the vehicle was surrounded Numerous, uh, numerous law enforcement officers and sheriff's office from the Melbourne Police Department uh, surrounded the vehicle, ordering the occupants out. It took about 10 or 15 minutes before they ultimately were able to break one of the SUV windows, ordering the occupants out. Uh, at gunpoint, after several minutes, uh, Ms. Kirchner exited the vehicle, and shortly after that, this was followed by uh, Mr. Bradley. They were taken into custody and placed in patrol cars. As the search for and the pursuit of an ultimate apprehension of Ms. Bradley and Mr. Bradley and Ms. Kirchner were proceeding, fire rescue units had arrived at the scene on the land away and, and began treating deputy telephone engines. You'll hear from one of the first original responding uh, paramedics that uh, when she arrived, deputy killed the weapon was still in her holster. We hadn't even had a chance to remove a deputy troop will tell you deputy troop will tell you the same thing. He was the very first person on scene. Deputy Phil's weapon was still in his holster. He ultimately removed it for protection during the number of people arriving on scene for medical care and placed it in the trunk of his vehicle and later turned his uh, her weapon over to the uh, crime scene coast. Deputy Phil was transported by one of the, uh, the rescue units to the emergency room at Holmes Regional Medical Center where she was later pronounced dead by Dr. Bartell Turk. An autopsy was conducted on Deputy Phil's remains the following day. Dr. Sajid Kaiser, the medical examiner, determined that the cause of death of Deputy Phil was multiple gunshot wounds and that the manner of her death was homicide. He will testify as to the five separate gunshot wounds that were suffered by Deputy Phil, including one to the head that he characterized as fatal, one to the arm that he characterized as lethal. He'll testify that he removed two complete projectiles from the body of Deputy Phil, and a third projectile that consisted of fragments of lead and fragments of jacketing, uh, copper jacket that he removed from her skull bed. Crime scene investigators arrived at each of the locations and processed all of the scenes. They processed the scene, taking photographs, detailing all the property that was left outside and what had been taken. They processed the, sh the shooting scene on Elena Way. You'll hear the crime scene investigator, the lead crime scene investigator, uh, Stephanie Cooper, who will testify that at the scene, in addition to the uh, medical residue that was left by the rescue folks and some of the uniform pieces that had been cut off the deputy filter in the attempts to treat her. Uh, she located a number of items, including seven casings from the Glock 40 caliber uh, weapon that were located right there at the shooting scene. Uh, 
she collected a piece of projectile that had been, been collected a little bit distance away from between where the vehicle was and Deputy Phil's body, and then the projectile was located. You'll hear from another one of the crime scene investigators who prepared diagrams of it. You'll see photographs of the scene, and you will see the actual exhibits themselves as to what was covered there. You'll hear that the garage on Janewood, where Mr. Weber had seen the white female, was processed also by members of the Melbourne Police Department. The crime scene officer Ron Strike will testify that it was hard to process the scene because Mr. Weber's garage is a mess. This guy's a collector, he's a workman, he's got all sorts of stuff in this garage. But working with Mr. Weber, they went through and they detailed what they could find as to what was missing. They did not find anything missing from the garage, not even the gas can, for instance. But what they did find was a cell phone. A cell phone that you will hear belonged to Ms. Kirchner, the one that had been utilized and left the open line that allowed Mr. Villegas to overhear the conversation between Mr. Bradley and Ms. Kirchner in the vehicle the deputy Bill stop. There wasn't a lot of scene to, uh, to process at the parkway location where the residence or where the vehicle was stopped and the two defendants taken into custody, but you will hear that they took the vehicle back to the sheriff's office impound, kept it there for two days while they got a search warrant and they ultimately searched the vehicle pursuant to the search warrant. Photographs were taken of all the crime scenes, physical evidence was collected, items processed for DNA and fingerprints. It appeared that when Stephanie Cooper and the other agents assisting her searched the vehicle, the white SUV, <clears throat> located in the vehicle in an area where uh, apparently a cover had popped off in the middle of the dashboard that had uh, some either controls for air conditioning or for some sound system, there was an opening in the dashboard. And in there, uh, crime scene tech Cooper found the 40 caliber block handgun that had been stolen by Mr. Marks and sold to the defendant Brandon Bradley. You'll hear that you now it's the same weapon because uh, Mr. Seaton, the fellow who owned the weapon, can tell you what the serial number was. He's got the paperwork as to what the serial number was of the weapon that he bought and was stolen from him. You will see the serial number. You'll actually see the weapon that was recovered by Stephanie Cooper. You will hear that two magazines for the Glock handgun were recovered. One a 10-round magazine, the other one a 9-round magazine. You will hear that one of the magazines was fully loaded and that the other magazine, the 10 round magazine, had only one round left in. You will hear from Stephanie Cooper that when she went to safety, the weapon that she removed from the dashboard area, there was a live round in the chamber of the weapon. For the 10 round magazine, one left in the magazine, one left in the chamber, there were eight rounds missing heard that uh, she collected seven spent casings from the crime scene at Elena Way. You will also hear that inside the vehicle on the floorboard, she collected an eighth spent casing. These items were processed and, and sent off for examination by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement firearms experts. You will hear that also in the vehicle, they located a suitcase with man's clothing and a box of ammo that matched the ammo that had been in the, uh, the Glock revolver, semi-automatic. And that there were three remaining cartridges in a plastic tray inside this cardboard ammo box. You will hear that Stephanie Cooper processed the plastic tray for fingerprints, and she sent those off to the ID section of the Sheriff's Office for further examination. You'll hear that there was the hotel property recovered from the inside of the SUV. They recovered the bedspreads, the sheets, the pillows, uh, the air conditioning cover, even the ice bus bucket and the, the trash can were still in the SUV at the time that it was stopped. The ballistics analysis was done by Amy Seward of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And it was done of the Glock handgun, the casings that were recovered at the crime scene, and also the projectiles that were recovered. In addition to the projectiles that the medical examiner removed. There was another full projectile that was recovered at Holmes Regional Medical Center from underneath the body of Deputy Bill that was sent off for processing. 
there was a projectile piece that was found inside the driver's door of the white SUV when they checked. They observed that there was a bullet hole inside the door from the inside into the doorway and they located the projectile inside that. Uh, when Agent Seward testifies about her examination, she will tell you that the examination that she conducted of the projectile from the front piece of the body armor from Deputy Bill, the projectile from the left posterior chest wall, the medical examiner, Sam her removing Deputy Bill's body, the projectile from the right upper back that the medical examiner removed Deputy Bill's body, the Deputy the projectile fragment that was under Deputy Bill that was recovered at Holmes Regional Medical Center, and the jacket portion that was removed from the vehicle's driver's door were all matched to that particular Glock 40 caliber revolver that was found in the SUV. You will also hear that there were additional fragments that were found inside the driver's door, a jacket base that was found in Deputy Bill's head, as well as a fragment that was found in her head and a jacket fragment that was found on Elena Way were examined, but that the examiner, Ms. Seward, could not uh, conclude either that they were definitely fired or that they weren't definitely fired from that, projectile, from that weapon, so that they could have been or could not have been. There were a couple additional pieces of lead that had been recovered by the examiners, by the crime scene investigators, that the examiner could not determine, or had determined that there were no sufficient characteristics to even attempt to match. You will hear that uh, Ms. Seward examined all eight of the casings, the seven that were recovered on the lane away and the one from inside the vehicle, and determined that all eight casings were fired inside the lock that was recovered from the vehicle. DNA testing was done. Ms. Cooper will testify about how she took swabs from the weapon cartridges and projectiles and the casings sent them all off for, for examination to determine if they could be matched up anyway. You will hear that DNA samples were taken from uh, Mr. Bradley, from Ms. Kirchner, and a DNA sample was obtained from the remains of uh, Deputy Bill. And you will hear the FDLE and analyst Corey Crumble testify about the results of those. The summary is the main one that agent will testify about is that DNA testing was done on a swab that uh, included the trigger and textured areas of the Glock semi-automatic pistol. Pistol area and then the grip area that was textured. And that the agent was able to make a DNA profile from there. was able to determine that there was a DNA profile in the DNA left on those areas of the weapon. And when she examined, when he examined that DNA profile and compared it to the DNA profile submitted by Brandon Bradley, it was determined that it was a match. And it was determined that Andrea Kirchner's DNA profile was excluded as having been any of the DNA recovered from the weapon. The only person identified as having touched the trigger and handle area of that weapon was Brandon Bradley. Fingerprints were found on the plastic tray that uh, Stephanie Cooper had processed and sent off to the ID section. And they were examined by ID experts at the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. And the fingerprint latents that were removed from the tray matched the fingerprint standards that were taken from the defendant, Brandon Bradley. Going back now to the scene where the vehicle was apprehended and the defendants were apprehended, the vehicle stopped finally at uh, Parkwood. The defendant, Brandon Bradley, was placed into a patrol car with uh, a sheriff's office deputy. He was driven from the scene there at Parkway to the Criminal Investigation Division building of the sheriff's office on Gus Hip Road in Rockledge. There he was placed into an interview room by himself with the uh, deputy to, to watch over him. He was offered water or so, whatever he wanted, and he was allowed to, to sleep as they interviewed other witnesses, including Ms. Kirchner, attempted to follow other leads before they began their interview. I believe the evidence will show that he slept from approximately 12.30 to 7 p.m. During that period, he was not threatened or mistreated in any way. In fact, 
fact, he was allowed pretty much to sleep peacefully uninterrupted by the agents. At approximately 7 o'clock in the evening, the agents woke him up and began to interview him. They started out the interview by reading him his Miranda rights, making sure that he understood them and that he agreed to waive Mr. Bradley understood his Miranda rights, freely and voluntarily waived them, and conducted an interview with agents Wayne Simmons and Mike Spadafore, which is a videotaped interview that you will see. During the interview, Brandon Bradley admitted and confessed that he was the one who shot and killed Deputy Margaret Bell. I submit that if you listen to the witnesses and examine the evidence carefully, you will conclude that the state has met its burden in this case and that the evidence supports the verdicts that we ask you to return. Guilty is charged on count one, first degree murder. Guilty is charged on count two, robbery. Guilty is charged on count three, fleeing and looting police officers. And guilty is charged on count four, resisting arrest for violence. Thank you. Okay. Before we proceed with opening statements on behalf of the defense, I don't want to break up their statement, so it would be appropriate for us to go ahead and take a break at this time. We're going to take a brief recess. It'll be a little over 10 minutes, so we're going to take a recess until 10 minutes to 3. You, jurors, you must continue to abide by your rules governing your service as a juror, and we will be in recess until 10 minutes to 3. Thank you. All right. will go forward with their opening statements and then the state needs to have their first witness ready. The court will be in re recess until 10 minutes till 3. Thank you.